All right, so we've got our last speaker coming up. And this is really a treat. So this is about the feet on the ground. This is about the people who are actually doing work and having tremendous impact. We're about to welcome Prince Emmanuel de Marode from Virunga National Park. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Prince Emmanuel. After training as an anthropologist, Dr. Emmanuel de Marode worked for 20 years in support of Congo's national parks. He spent most of those years in the field supporting Congolese park rangers through the 12 year civil war that claimed the lives of over 5 million civilians and 140 of the rangers with whom he worked. In 2007, after witnessing the slaughter of nine mountain gorillas by armed militias and investigating the root causes of environmental destruction in Eastern Congo, he decided to focus his efforts on overcoming the illegal trafficking of natural resources in Virunga National Park. As a result of these efforts, he was appointed as Chief Warden of Virunga National Park by the Congolese government in 2008. To overcome the various challenges in the post-conflict region, he helped to develop the Virunga Alliance, a Congolese initiative to create an alternative clean development strategy capable of eradicating poverty and bringing stability and peace to Eastern Congo based on the sustainable use of water resources for energy and fisheries together with agriculture and tourism. It's a real treat. Please welcome Prince Emmanuel de Marode. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, good morning. Um, it's an incredible privilege. I'm extremely grateful to be here. Um, I think I, perhaps more than most, um, need to explain who I am. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier with respect to a lot of the discussions um, that are going on today. But actually, I'd like, to, over the next um, few minutes, just explain how important um, the work that people like yourselves are doing to um, the future of uh, a region that desperately needs change. Um, and really, the way I would like to do that is um, through the um, extraordinary team that I, I work with. Um, and um, in that, um, to, 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 to explain who I am, I'm essentially uh, um, what, you, what you would define as a, a middle-ranking civil servant in the um, Congolese public service. I work for the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo as a um, national park warden, um, as the director of a national park that's called Virunga National Park. Um, it's located in the east of the country in a region that has been affected by what is now recognized as um, the most um, tragic episode in human history in terms of human suffering since um, the Second World War, a war that's claimed the lives of over six million Congolese people, six million people who, who should not have, have died in that way. And every single one of those wars has started either in or immediately around um, this national park um, that we've been trying to manage now for, for over 20 years. Um, and it's this extraordinary team that I work with whose, whose, whose story it is I, I, I tell. Um, but for me, at the beginning, growing up in East Africa, growing up in Kenya, I had this very different image. I had this image of this landscape in the center of Africa um, with these incredible mountains, some of the highest mountains um, on the African continent, with glaciers on top, um, and that stretched down through tropical rainforests across these amazing savannas with some of the greatest abundance of large mammals, of elephants, hippos, um, and buffaloes, and then through to these extraordinary volcanoes, um, these, these permanently erupting volcanoes that give you a glimpse of the very center of, of the Earth. Um, and between these extremes, um, some of the greatest diversity of wildlife on Earth, what essentially made it, um, what essentially makes it probably the greatest national park on Earth. And of course, that one species that, that drew me to Virunga um, 23 years ago, which is the mountain gorilla, um, this incredibly vulnerable species that's right on the edge of extinction. Um, but when I arrived, I, I bought a motorbike um, in, in Kampala and drove across East Africa and then across the border, across the, 
um, the great East African Rift Valley and then down um, into um, this, this amazing landscape. What um, brought me there were the mountain gorillas and, and, and this, amazing, um, um, this amazing national park. But what really kept me there um, was um, this team of um, Congolese rangers. Um, and very quickly, what I realized as I, I became, over the years, a part of that team, was just the incredible sacrifice um, that they had gone through. Um, over 140 of them had died protecting this park, and yet for months and sometimes years on end, they hadn't received their salaries, they hadn't received any support from the outside world, and yet they were continuing this struggle because it was the work that they had always done, that their parents had done, and that grandparents had done. This is the oldest national park in Africa. It's the first to where conservation was born in Africa. Um, and this tradition was, was continuing in spite of the incredible difficulties. Um, and, um, and it was met with incredible success. The mountain gorillas were, um, were increasing. They doubled um, over the last uh, 20 years until this terrible day in 2007 um, when we heard gunshots up in the forest um, and um, came across um, the beginning of what was um, seemingly the end of this, this species, the mountain gorillas. They were being, um, they were being exterminated by um, militias that were moving into the forest and killing the gorillas. And that really was the, the event that um, precipitated a, a series of um, decisions that um, ended up with a situation where I was asked by the government um, to take on this incredible privilege, which was to lead uh, Virunga's Rangers as, as their director. Um, and so we, we continued from there. But what I didn't realize was that my work was not going to be about protecting mountain gorillas or wildlife or managing a national park. Um, it was about managing a deeply, deeply troubled um, political situation. Um, and within weeks of when I was appointed, um, I, we discovered that an army was being created, a rebel army. Um, and um, very soon, that um, erupted into um, the third of the great wars of Eastern Congo, um, these wars that killed literally millions of people. And of course, this was the view just outside my tent um, when I woke up in the morning. Um, it was a war that came right up to um, the park headquarters. Um, and within, within days, um, our um, staff were forced out on this terrible march towards the city of Goma and into these internally displaced camps. Suddenly I found myself from being a park director to being somebody who had to manage a refugee camp um, for, the, for the rangers and their families. Um, and suddenly we had to readapt ourselves to a situation of crisis. Um, and um, this, um, uh, this continued, but I was surrounded by um, these um, very extraordinary um, people, and it's them really who led me, led me forward, um, helped me with these ideas. Um, and the first was this decision never to leave the park. And so we spoke to people, we spoke to the rebel leaders, we spoke to the government, and out of that came this agreement that the park would continue its work whatever the political situation. Um, and, um, um, and we were able to continue the work. But what really um, struck us, what was a real problem, was this um, struggle um, with respect to this national park. And there was this one photo, this um, terrible photo that was taken by uh, a, a good friend of mine of this, wimp, of this woman um, at the feet of one of our rangers. And it really captured for me the struggle that we were up against. So it's, not a simple, it's not a simple matter. This woman was trying to get into the park um, um, to obtain charcoal. And of course, the victim here is the woman. But it's not that simple. Um, the, the woman is a, a victim of the armed militias who are trying to extract the resources. It's like a protection racket. Um, and you've got this economic situation around the park um, where you have um, what is essentially um, what was once a colonial economy based entirely on the extractive industries um, that's gradually involved into, evolved into a conflict economy. And it's based around the extraction of charcoal, um, in, in the forest, the destruction of the forest for charcoal, um, the destruction of the water resources for illegal fishing, and then more recently, these, this international corporation 
um, that came into the park for illegal oil. Um, and and this, this economy was essentially based on coercion and patronage um, and was breeding these armed groups. And what we found was this situation where we had 12 armed militias that were drawn to the park around these resources, fish on the lake, illegal fishing on the lake, um, charcoal in the forests, um, and then this illegal oil. And the three together um, were generating about $100 million a year for the armed groups. Um, and we were completely disempowered in our ability to confront this. And you know, one way of, of explaining this is through my, my colleagues, um, Innocent and Branumwe, my, my deputy, whose brother was killed um, protecting the mountain gorillas, Rodrigue, um, who um, spearheaded the investigation into the illegal oil. Um, for his efforts, he was illegally detained for 17 days and, and, and very, very badly tortured to the extent that we had to get him out of the country. Um, and then Atama, um, this, 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 this dear man who I worked with right from the beginning 23 years ago, um, who moved up through the ranks and became a warden. Um, one day when he was coming back to the park, he was shot in the back by militias and died of his injuries. Um, and so we were losing all these amazing people um, who were helping us to protect the park. My day came um, on, a, on, a, on a warm day in April um, when, I, um, when I submitted the report um, on the, the investigation into the illegal oil to the state prosecutor, this investigation that we've been carrying out for, for four years um, into the illegal um, exploration for oil. Um, I believed, as I, I still do now, in my naivety, that um, there is something about the, the sanctity of the rule of law, what, you know, what holds society together. And I submitted this report. Um, as I was coming back, um, five men um, were waiting for me um, in the forest, um, and they shot me in the, in the chest and in the stomach and left me in the forest. Um, it was two young Congolese farmers who, who saw this happen. Um, and as I was um, alone in, in the forest, they, they came and picked me up and put me on a, on a motorbike um, and for two hours managed to get me to this local hospital um, who performed a, a miracle um, that enabled me to go back to my work um, and to really rethink what, what we were doing. Um, and really what that, what that came to was this idea that we were just too small, um, too vulnerable, too weak to really confront these big problems that we were facing. Um, and this idea of the Virunga Alliance, of drawing in other players based on certain values, values to do with upholding the needs and the rights of the most vulnerable and the poorest in society, um, of um, upholding the needs and the rights of future generations, um, the whole concept of sustainability, um, and of course, of upholding the rule of law, the, 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 the rules that hold our societies together. Um, and, but we needed the resources, and those resources really focused around three key things, four, four if you include fishing. Um, but the first is energy, you know, this, this idea that you need to recreate a whole new industry, a whole new economy um, that is based around diverse, diversification of the economy and that's based around this idea that you've got to break um, the conflict economy um, that has been there for so long. And really, that is, um, um, you know, one of the very great challenges. And it's not that it hasn't been tried. You know, the international community, the world has invested $90 billion in Eastern Congo since, um, since 2000 in trying to put an end to the war. It's the biggest UN mission in the world, and it's failed. And the reason it's failed is because um, of the whole demobilization of the armed militias. Where we are, there are between five and 8,000 of them. It's not that much. It shouldn't be insurmountable. Um, but the, the demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration process has failed because of the R in that acronym, the reintegration. Um, and that has failed because there are no jobs in Eastern Congo. There's 70, 80% unemployment. And really, the answer lies 
in the kinds of work that people like yourselves are doing, um, of creating successful enterprise that can create sustainable livelihoods for those people. Um, and so we looked at those resources that can provide that. And there's, there's water, the two untapped resources of Congo, water um, and the human resources. And you know, what can we do with that to turn this economy around? Um, the others, of course, are agribusiness and tourism, the traditional industry for a national park. Um, and we invested massively in that. It's not, perhaps not massively by, by your standards, but for us it was a lot. You know, we've, we've now reached an investment, you know, committed funds of about $92 million um, to try and get sustainable energy to these, to these communities. And what we discovered is that in doing that, for every megawatt of electricity that you provide to conflict-affected communities, you can create between 800 and 1,000 jobs. Um, and the, the research that we did in the early days demonstrated that we could create between 100 and 120 megawatts. That's 80 to 100,000 jobs in the community around the park. And we're well, under, we're not well on our way now. Um, the, um, you know, we, we've now got the committed funds for 50 megawatts. We're halfway there. But um, if you remember the figure, five to 8,000 militias, that's five to 8% um, of those jobs that we're in the process of creating. Um, and so really, that's, that's the answer. Um, and it, it lies right at the heart of the kinds of work that, that you are doing. Um, you know, one, one example is the soap factory um, that, we, that has invested um, in Eastern Congo because of the fact that there's electricity and because of the fact that the park is bringing a degree of stability to that region. The soap factory has created 400 jobs. So it's a $5 million investment. Five million jo uh, 400 jobs in a, in a conflict-affected community. But it's also increased the revenue for 10,000 farmers. And it's decreased the price of soap for 5 million Congolese consumers. Um, and so really, that's, that's the answer to conflict. It's a much smaller investment than the 90 billion um, from the public sector, and it really comes from the kinds of ideas that people like yourself are, are, are developing today. So really, that's why I came, was just to, to thank you um, for these amazing ideas and for this amazing work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Sorry, I used that more than my fair share of time. I'm glad you used the extra time. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. I knew you'd be glad you stayed, but we're going to let you go now. So the next session started at 11. I want to let you know there is another plenary this evening from 5.30 to 6.30, so please join us back here for that. And next up, we have a session that sort of continues the theme from the morning um, that'll start at 11 around impact investing sort of at this tipping point and hitting the mainstream if you'd like to stick around. Thank you so much.